All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Law School. My name is Mark Wu. I am the Henry L. Stimson Professor. And it's my pleasure today uh, to welcome uh, Executive Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis. Uh, before I do so, I should mention that um, we uh, have the pleasure of having today's event sponsored by the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies, the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center's Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship, the Harvard Law School, International Legal Studies, uh, and most of all, most importantly, the Harvard International Law Journal, uh, many of whose staff are here today. I want to give a special shout out to Annalie Medina, Jackson Niagli, the uh, two editors in chiefs who are here with us, as well as George Papadimitru, the symposium chair who uh, took on many of the logistics for today's event. So um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the executive vice president. Uh, he has been deeply involved in shaping the European economy and developing the tools uh, for modern economic statecraft for the European Union. Um, prior to stepping into this position, he was the 20th Prime Minister of Latvia from 2009 to 2014. Prior to that, he was a member of the European Parliament. Uh, and since uh, taking on roles in the Commission, uh, he's uh, overseen uh, as Vice President of the Euro and Social Dialogue uh, from 2014 to 2019 from 2016 through 2020, including a perilous period uh, involving Brexit. He was the Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets. So really at the heart of reestablishing European policy and European financial stability in the wake of Brexit. Um, he currently chairs the Commissioner's Group on the Economy that Works for All People, including having overseen this during the pandemic and the recovery period. Uh, he is the Trade Commissioner for Europe, so he's leading uh, Europe's efforts at the World Trade Organization, its bilateral trade negotiations, including one that just restarted with India. Uh, he's been deeply involved in the heart of thinking through the sanctions response, uh, the European energy, uh, European economic resiliency in light of the uh, events uh, from stemming from last February in Russia and the Ukraine. Um, and on top of that, he is the co-chair of the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, uh, along with uh, Commissioner Vestager, uh, USTR Thai, and Secretary Raimundo. Um, he is the lead uh, for the European Union on the EU-China high-level economic dialogue. So just that, that, that's just some of the titles. Uh, you can go on their website and you can see the other responsibilities that come into play. But that's why I think it's no exaggeration to say uh, this is the man who really has been at the heart of the European economy and a European economic statecraft. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to Harvard. I know it's been seven years. It's been seven years too long. The world has changed quite a bit since you were here. But one thing that we are very glad is to have a very full audience of students, faculty, and community members um, to demonstrate the strength of the transatlantic relationship and its importance here at Harvard. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, Honorable uh, Professor Wu, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is uh, uh, truly an honor for me uh, to be here in uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, I'm c coming directly from uh, Washington, uh, D.C., where I represented the European Union in the IMF and World Bank meetings. Uh, I had the chance to meet my American counterparts and uh, ministers from around uh, the world. Uh, at these uh, gatherings and at others I have uh, recently attended, notably uh, G20 in Indonesia, uh, there is a sense of upheaval in the air. Uh, the world is clearly changing, uh, and I want to share some thoughts uh, with you on why these changes are happening and how they may play out. Uh, above all, I want to explain uh, why I believe strong Atlantic, transatlantic leadership is uh, needed at this uh, moment, uh, because uh, without it, it, the world may change in ways that are contrary to our shared uh, values. Uh, as uh, Harvard uh, students, you are leaders of uh, tomorrow, and uh, my hope is for you to 
uh, enter the world of work with the same uh, optimism uh, that uh, I did as I graduated. Uh, when I was your age, uh, the changes happening in the world seemed uh, overwhelmingly positive. Uh, my generation of Latvians grew under the rigid restrictions of the Soviet Union, but as graduates in early 1990s, we were entering a new reality of freedom and choice. We uh, felt hopeful and confident that our talents and ambitions could achieve their maximum expression in the world. Uh, I hope you will get to experience the same, but uh, to make sure this happens, uh, to make sure your leadership can achieve full potential, the leaders of today must fight for our cherished, uh, cherished Western values of uh, democracy, rule of law, human rights, economic freedom, and to tackle climate change. We must uh, strive for the world, uh, 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 for the world order where uh, Harvard's law school motto, truth, law, and justice, continues to be the guiding light. Uh, uh, if the EU and US uh, fail to lead the way at this crucial moment, uh, uh, truth, law, and justice may be overtaken by something uh, far uh, darker. Uh, I'm speaking, of course, of uh, Russia's uh, brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine and its profound impact on today's world. Uh, this is not a regional conflict on the fringes of the European uh, Union. Uh, we have entered an existential battle. Uh, innocent men, women and children are dying because of Putin's war of choice. Uh, uh, in uh, this uh, despot, Europe faces an enemy with nuclear bombs at its uh, fingertips. The uh, war is causing uh, turmoil across many parts of the globe, with uh, families and businesses uh, facing a global spike in food and energy prices. There are deep uh, financial and monetary implications. Uh, Russia, and Russia alone, bears the responsibility for these problems. Uh, as the war's uh, shockwaves ripple across continents, uh, they are causing a profound realignment of international relations, economically and geopolitically. Uh, so far, the democratic world has rallied together in a huge show of solidarity. Uh, this uh, unity caught Putin and other autocrats around the world by a surprise. Uh, but this uh, war is a test case of our democratic values and our ability to convince uh, others to stand up against a brutal attack on a sovereign nation. Uh, we are profoundly grateful to the United States and our like-minded allies for their support to Ukraine and coordination on sanctions against Russia. Uh, we know how to focus on reaching beyond our like-minded partners. Uh, first, we need to fight uh, the global information war. And we need to invest real resources in this uh, work, both uh, at home and abroad. Uh, at home, we had seen for uh, many years uh, anti-democratic forces, including Russia, meddling in the internal politics of the EU. Uh, by supporting uh, extremist and anti-European parties, using lobbyists, paid think tanks, uh, online disinformation and hacking. Uh, and we know that this meddling is not limited to Europe. So we should stay, uh, take stronger action against this uh, interference. The European Commission will soon propose a defense of democracy package to protect our democratic sphere from uh, covert foreign influence. Uh, at the global level, we need to dramatically improve our outreach. Uh, only by working together across regions and across uh, platforms uh, we can get the message out that the current food energy crisis are not caused by Western sanctions, but by Russia's war and readiness to game on hunger and starvation. Uh, in a wider sense, we need to invest heavily in alliance building, particularly with the developing world. Uh, there are many uh, potentially like-minded uh, allies out, out there. Uh, to reach them and to get them on board, we need to get out of our uh, comfort zone. Uh, in practice, it means uh, doing more to understand and address uh, their needs. The EU and US share the same uh, view, uh, namely that the war in, uh, in Ukraine is a 
brutal attack on a sovereign democratic nation by an autocratic regime. Uh, but uh, a number of emerging economies and developing countries see this war differently. Uh, some are taking geopolitical advantage of it, uh, including by increasing trade and cooperation with an aggressor state. Some justify the neutrality by recalling historical injustices. Uh, take the UN vote in March. Uh, five non-democratic regimes blocked the resolution condemning Russia's uh, war, but another 35 abstained. Uh, this is the middle ground I'm uh, talking about. These are the countries we need to uh, persuade. Uh, and we are in a race against the clock, uh, because non-democratic powers are uh, rushing to form their own alliances uh, against so-called declining West. Uh, indeed, the uh, most uh, powerful among them uh, already have strong economic and political bonds with uh, the developing world. The developing world uh, needs to feel that uh, we are there for them and will help them to weather this crisis. Uh, our actions towards them will count more than words. So, uh, what can we do? Uh, we need to be visible on the ground and engage both at local and global levels. Uh, the EU has, uh, for example, ramped up its engagement in Africa, both on bilateral and on region-to-region -region basis. Uh, we need to reform our global institutions so that decision-making uh, works equally well for developed, uh, uh, developing, uh, uh, emerging, and uh, 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 so for developed, emerging, and less uh, uh, developed uh, economies. Uh, the same goes for international financial institutions. Uh, they can deliver more development finance, while uh, in return, developing countries uh, need to ensure that they have correct governance framework in place. Uh, emerging markets feel spillovers from our interest rate adjustments, and we are mindful of that. Uh, good progress is being made uh, on special drawing rights to help vulnerable countries. Uh, voluntary contributions of uh, $80 billion have been pledged towards a global goal of $100 billion. Uh, $23 billion comes from the EU. Uh, the US has pledged $20 billion, so this still needs to be approved by Congress. Uh, it is important that the EU and US continue to show leadership, encouraging more countries to pledge. Uh, we should also keep pushing for the implementation of the common framework for debt treatment. Uh, almost all G20 members would uh, support the publication of indicative guidelines to provide additional clarity and predictability to eligible countries. Uh, however, opposition from China has so far prevented the guidelines uh, adoption. Uh, in parallel, it will be important to uh, strengthen the, to continue the international work on uh, strengthened debt transparency uh, and to address challenges stemming from uh, collateralized debt transactions. Uh, we also need to help the most vulnerable countries to deal with the worst spillover effects. So, we welcome the new IMF uh, uh, food shock window to support uh, Ukraine and other countries. Uh, since it requires more resources, the European Commission will contribute uh, 100 million euros to the poverty reduction and growth trust subsidy accounts. Uh, fixing the World Trade Organization is a crucial piece of puzzle. Uh, it needs to be revitalized, updated and reimagined. The uh, 12th WTO Ministerial Conference took place in June. Uh, against expectations, it succeeded in delivering a number of very significant outcomes. Uh, during these intense weeks of uh, negotiations in uh, Geneva, we sat down with uh, countries uh, from around uh, the world. There were huge differences of opinion. But we also saw that results are achievable because, uh, broadly speaking, most countries still want a functioning rules based for global trade. They uh, recognize that uh, this remains their best bet for achieving their economic uh, potential. Uh, a reform WTO must treat everyone the same, which brings me to my next uh, point. Uh, uh, I would like to say a brief word on China. 
uh, its uh, failure to condemn Russia's barbaric war and in some cases uh, outright support for Russia is influencing the views of uh, EU countries and companies. Uh, but it's also true that despite worsening political context, uh, EU-China trade remains robust and our economies are much more interlinked than uh, it's the case with the US and China. Uh, accordingly, the EU should continue engaging with China with uh, pragmatism and without naivety. Uh, we recognize that our trading relationships needs more balance and reciprocity. And uh, working with the US, we must place a greater focus on diversification and better risk management. Uh, but we also need to work together to, on shaping joint responses to global trade and economic challenges, such as uh, disruptions of the supply chains, WTO reform, and issues related to food security and global level playing field. I'll be happy to provide uh, more uh, views on uh, China in our uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, uh, in a general sense, uh, trade has a crucial role to play to help the EU and US advance our shared geopolitical goals. By developing rules-based relationships with countries around the world, by incentivizing our companies and investors to make a positive economic impact on those countries, we increase our wider attractiveness and trustworthiness as partners. Uh, the EU and US are uh, committed to the green and digital transitions of our economies. By supporting and incentivizing similar transformations in partner countries, we can build a greener economy as well, uh, as, well as a democratic and trustworthy digital infrastructure. Uh, this can also help create resilient supply chains, notably for critical raw materials and inputs. This is why the EU is determined to ramp up our trade outreach, uh, notably to Latin America and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, last, let me turn to the transatlantic relationship itself. The EU-US relationship is the central artery of the world economy. Uh, last year, we traded uh, almost 1 trillion euros worth of goods and services, and our supply chains are deeply intertwined. But uh, our uh, relationship goes far beyond economics. Uh, we have aligned views on most of the global challenges. We have opened positive new chapters over the last uh, two years. We have put several disputes uh, to bed and found new dynamic avenues of cooperation. The Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council is a living proof of this uh, renewal. Uh, this new forum is uh, designed to shape rules, tools and standards of the future. This is a laboratory of the 21st century ideas. The TDC's structure is agile enough to address uh, emerging challenges. Uh, we notably achieved rapid cooperation on sanctions against Russia via export controls and aligning measures on import bans. Uh, we expanded its uh, remit to address uh, global food insecurity and supply chain issues, as well as meeting the challenge of Russia's information manipulation and interference. Uh, this is necessary because technologies will have increasingly dominant role in future conflicts, in a classical military, but also uh, hybrid warfare scenes. The TTC can be a vehicle to, a vehicle to address uh, this and other uh, challenges. Uh, of course, some difficulties uh, remain. Uh, the EU would notably uh, like to see US uh, fully take our needs uh, on board uh, whenever it is framing policies that impact us, and of course, uh, also vice versa. Uh, for example, while we fully support the aim of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act to help businesses and society reach uh, climate goals, uh, some of its provisions are very uh, worrying. Uh, many of the green subsidies provided for in the Act discriminate against EU automotive, uh, renewables, battery and energy intensive industries. The Inflation Reduction Act uh, privileges U.S. companies over others by offering uh, generous financial incentives. Uh, this risks weakening competition and raising prices. Uh, I add that the EU green subsidies are not designed in such a discriminatory uh, manner. 
Uh, we cannot afford to waste time and uh, uh, resources on trade disputes and other distractions. Um, there are too much at stake in the wider world. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to conclude on a more hopeful note. All the positive uh, changes I described are uh, achievable. A better world is possible. A world where you can emerge from this great house of learning and apply your talents to the fullest extent. But to achieve this better world, we must first stay the course and help Ukraine uh, win the war. And this uh, victory is within reach. We must therefore not allow division or fatigue to derail us. Uh, it is essential that full bipartisan support from the US continues for further sanctions against Russia and for funding and military support for uh, Ukraine. And in Europe, like, likewise, uh, now it's a time to show uh, the resolve. Uh, uh, if we stay united, working together, the EU and US can help to deliver justice for Ukraine. Uh, I view this as our shared duty uh, because Ukraine made a clear democratic choice to become a modern European state anchored in Western values. We must not fail them. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to engage in a short uh, conversation, and then we'll open up the audience questions. Um, the Mr. Vice President uh, really wanted to have a chance, especially to engage with students and the next generation of leaders here at Harvard. So uh, while we chat, please get your questions ready. And we left ample time, unlike other events, sometimes where you only get two or three uh, questions and we left ample time for students uh, and others to ask questions. But let me just kickstart this conversation. First, that was a fantastic speech in the sense that in a very succinct manner, you laid out a comprehensive vision of what's at stake. And it certainly is the case that since when you were last here seven years ago, the world is much more fragile, much more perilous. And it's almost cliche to say we're at a crossroads. But I think what's interesting in this country is there are some folks who think we're just locked in an era of strategic competition as opposed to an existential struggle. And you use that word, right, that really what's at stake here is existential in terms of liberal West and democracy and our values and so forth. And much of that, I suspect, the difference in viewpoint to the extent one exists as Ambassador Lambrinidis reminded us when he was here this spring, is due to differences in terms of what Europeans have experienced and what Americans have experienced. So in your own personal case, you grew up in the Soviet Union uh, under an autocratic system, and you've experienced the transition to democracy. Um, many Europeans, the experience of war, of the threat of fascism is one generation, two generations, three generations away. That's not true here in the United States. So I just want to ask you to elaborate. For the Americans here, uh, or those who will be watching this recording, who are not convinced that what we're in right now is really an era of existential struggle, um, they think it's just an economic competition, um, or it's just about right, no different than, say, the competition with Japan. Uh, we, we can sort of make harmony of all this. Can you sort of provide the counter argument? Why do you think you and so many other Europeans think that what we're locked in right now is truly existential and perhaps the most important fight of our lifetime? Uh, well, uh, uh, I think it's uh, to the extent uh, evident. We are not talking about economic uh, competition uh, anymore. Uh, we are at open uh, warfare. And uh, uh, Russia, uh, for example, is uh, very uh, open about this, that if they uh, succeed uh, in Ukraine, they are going to invade other countries. So this uh, war is uh, uh, going to uh, spread further if we are not uh, stopping it uh, right now. And we see that uh, uh, Russia's action is also encouraging autocratic uh, regimes around the world. And we see globally more, more tension and more potential for uh, conflict. So that's why it's 
also very important to stop it at uh, its uh, uh, current steps. And uh, Russia is also uh, very uh, open that uh, uh, this is not a fight against uh, uh, only Ukraine. This is a fight against what they are calling declining or rotting West. Uh, and uh, they are uh, working to form alliances of one could say like-minded countries which would share this uh, Russia's uh, view. So uh, 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 also from that per perspective, this conflict has a potential to uh, spread. It's not something just regional uh, 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 or um, uh, on the doorsteps of uh, uh, European Union. So uh, uh, that's why we think that it's important that the Western democratic world indeed stays united, stay, uh, shows the necessary uh, resolve and really stops the war in uh, Ukraine, make sure that Ukraine is winning this war because that's a way to uh, also stop the wider ramifications of this war. You invited us to draw China into this discussion and certainly Russia and uh, is not the only uh, actor speaking about Western decay or about um, the perils of the current political structure or the inability to deal with the social and economic inequality woes here in the West. Um, the 20th Party Congress opens uh, tomorrow in Beijing. Um, we're really um, experiencing a Europe that is reconsidering its relationship with China. The German finance minister made reference to the point that um, Europe should not be blackmailed anymore. Um, I wanted just to invite you to say a little bit more about um, your point that the economic nature of the relationship is very different between Europe and China as opposed to US and China. To what extent, when you speak with um, cabinet officials uh, in the Biden administration uh, or with Republicans on the Hill um, or elsewhere uh, or prior administration officials from the Trump administration, do you think there is a difference in point of view in terms of how um, our two sides of the transatlantic relationship view China or do you think there is increasing convergence and if there's increasing convergence, where is that convergence towards? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, on uh, China, um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, our uh, economic and trade relations, we actually uh, share many of the same uh, uh, concerns which the uh, U.S. Uh, has. Uh, issues like uh, 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 industrial subsidies and transparency of industrial subsidies, competitive neutrality of uh, state-owned enterprises, intellectual property rights, uh, all these uh, uh, concerns, we are having uh, uh, the same. So we're also uh, working together uh, uh, bilaterally, trilaterally in EU, US, uh, Japan format, in, in other formats of like-minded countries like Ottawa Group uh, uh, to see uh, what is the best way to address it. And we uh, uh, therefore also saying that, uh, as I was mentioning, WTO needs a reform to restore this global level playing field because currently we are not having this global level uh, playing uh, field. But uh, talking more broadly, uh, well, in EU, uh, we uh, see uh, uh, kind of that relations with China are very uh, complex. So we are saying that we see China as cooperation partner in some areas, economic competitor in others, and strategic rival in yet others. So on a cooperation uh, partner, for example, if we want to deal with uh, climate change, which is a global uh, challenge and uh, where uh, China is the uh, uh, biggest uh, emitter of um, uh, greenhouse gases, obviously we need China on board to address this global uh, challenge, so we need to cooperate. On economic competition, I already uh, uh, made a couple of points. Uh, on uh, systemic rivalry, it's true that China is promoting different socio-economic uh, value which is not uh, rooted in uh, Western uh, democratic uh, values. So there is this systemic uh, rivalry and also now uh, we see that on uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war, uh, China is uh, mainly, so to say, sitting on a fence and basically looking how to use this conflict to its own uh, uh, advantage and that's also now affecting thinking in the EU 
concerning uh, uh, our relations with uh, China. And I was mentioning it's uh, clear that uh, like we are now learning or have learned by now hopefully a very hard way that you cannot build uh, dependencies like we built a dependency from Russia on fossil fuels, especially on natural gas and we are now doing a lot of things and paying very high price to, to adjust it in a very short uh, time. Similarly, uh, we cannot have uh, dependencies on uh, China. That's why we're talking about diversification of our supply chains. That's why we're talking about this concept of uh, French shoring. So we need uh, indeed uh, 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 reliable and diversified uh, supply uh, chains and not develop new uh, uh, dependencies. So final question before I turn it open to the audience. Um, you're just uh, coming from a very busy week of meetings in Washington, not just with uh, officials in the Biden administration, but also the World Bank IMF annual meetings where I understand there was a more robust in-person gathering than has been the time uh, since the pandemic. And uh, what I wanna just invite you to chat about a little bit is um, we have an audience here of bright students who keep very much up to date uh, based on the news, based on Twitter, based on the blogs of what's happening. But sometimes we can be so mired in the details. Um, and you having just been in the midst of a very, very busy week, and thank you for taking time up to come up to Boston uh, and, uh, during all that. Um, in the midst of all that, what should they be thinking about in terms of looking out over the entire forest in the canopy as opposed to focusing on the trees? What would your advice be to the next generation of leaders who are going to be inheriting this world, what they should be focused on in their studies here and how they should be thinking about the types of issues? Um, what practical advice would you have? Oh my God, that's, <laughs> that's a very broad and complicated uh, 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 question. Well. Uh, uh, I think I outlined uh, some of those uh, elements. First, uh, we must be uh, ready to defend our democratic values because they are not self-evident uh, and, uh, uh, so to say, self-sustaining. It's something uh, which, uh, as a Western democratic world, we need to defend uh, because uh, if not, uh, many of the uh, possibilities, many of the opportunities uh, will just not be uh, there. Uh, second, uh, the world is now uh, going through uh, two major uh, transformations, green and uh, digital transformations of the economy. So in a sense, it's uh, important in which, whichever area of uh, studies, whichever area of uh, expertise to be uh, ready uh, to those green and digital uh, uh, transformations and to be agile to, to adjust uh, uh, the knowledge, the skills to, this, to these transformations and more generally, much more uh, 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 rapidly changing world of work as it was maybe uh, uh, decades or uh, generations ago. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We have two microphones here. Uh, before asking your question, if you don't mind identifying yourself, uh, and let's try to limit it to one question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, for making time to meet with us. I'm a professor here at the law school, a visiting professor. I'm teaching ESG and business and human rights. Uh, my name is Carlos Portugal Govia. So as you can imagine, your work has made my work as a professor much harder, much more interesting as well for the many, many, many changes, proposed changes in, in regulation. And it's uh, about that that I would like to ask. A few years ago, people that were like discussing ESG, uh, the New Green Deal, and things like that, would think, wow, well, that's just like feel good regulation of like the wealthiest countries in the world uh, with economies that were eventually doing pretty well. So people would think, well, when you have a moment in which you have challenges like war, inflation, and things like that, priorities will change because, you know, eventually those changes, the New Green Deal, uh, will be very expensive. 
So my question to you would be, in face of the uh, Russian war against Ukraine, what uh, is your perspective? The uh, uh, priority of the new Green Deal and ESG regulation policies, do you think that it increased or decreased in face of war and inflation? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as regards uh, European uh, Green uh, Deal, uh, that's our flagship uh, policy. So basically, the aim is to achieve uh, carbon neutrality by uh, 2050 and uh, uh, to reduce uh, our uh, uh, emissions by 55% by uh, 2030. So uh, uh, how uh, does now Russia's war affect uh, these uh, uh, plans? Well, uh, first of all, we were uh, clear that we are sticking with our plans and sticking with both 2030 and 2050 uh, targets. So uh, in terms of response, well, part of the response right now is uh, to quickly uh, diversify away from uh, Russia's fossil fuels. So uh, this year we spent a uh, lot of time to make sure that we have alternative suppliers, like Norway is now our biggest supplier of natural gas. Uh, US has stepped up very much its supplies other countries. So we managed to uh, diversify supplies. There were quite a few infrastructure projects uh, 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 as regards the gas infrastructure, so to say, to reorient uh, ourselves away from Russia's supplies to other supplies. Uh, but we uh, see these as a so to say, short to medium term uh, investments. So we are also mindful not to create uh, unnecessary uh, stranded assets with this. Uh, also to extend possible to have this infrastructure already ready for hydrogen flows and, and hydrogen economy as it's being uh, advanced. Um, uh, uh, it may well be that we'll be uh, seeing uh, more uh, coal in uh, this and next year than we would like uh, to see. Uh, some countries are considering their approach to nuclear, like uh, Germany, for example, uh, probably will let some of the nuclear power plants run longer than uh, previously uh, thought. Uh, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, part of our response is also actually to accelerate the Green Deal. So uh, to uh, have faster rollout of uh, renewables, uh, faster rollout of energy efficiency measures, because uh, at the heart of our problem is now high fossil fuel prices and volatility of this uh, fossil fuel prices, and the fact that Russia is using its fossil fuel supplies as weapon of black mine and manipulation. So we need to move away from all this, and there actually, the acceleration of the Green Deal and also additional investment. We are putting some additional also financial resources in this uh, from the EU and obviously EU member states themselves. Uh, so um, uh, uh, in a medium to long term, uh, if anything, it leads to acceleration of the Green Deal. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice President. Um, you stressed at the beginning of your speech today the importance of democratic values and the rule of law uh, in general and within the European context, especially in relation to the Russian aggression of Ukraine. As an EU citizen myself, I feel that there are many threats even within the European Union about democratic values, namely with, uh, with regards to Poland and, Ukraine, and uh, Hungary today. So my question is, um, what is your perspective on this, given the, the current you know, engagement of the European Commission um, uh, regarding the EU recovery plan uh, recently with Hungary and Poland? Um, because many citizens of the European Union, like myself, feel that the European Commission is not doing enough today in order to address these issues. Um, so if you can give just a little bit your perspective on this and uh, the perspective also of a man who grew up in the Soviet Union, not just the perspective of, man, of a man who's the vice president of the European Commission. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, obviously, we have uh, our own uh, challenges uh, within the EU with uh, which uh, we need uh, uh, to deal. And in recent years, we uh, have, uh, uh, so to say, strengthened uh, our ability to deal with rule of law issues within the EU, like setting up a so-called rule of law procedure which is now launched vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Poland and uh, Hungary. So uh, uh, we have tools in our uh, disposal, so to say, to counter issues if some countries are, uh, so to say, challenging uh, the rule of law. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, 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 there is now lots of questions. Uh, you mentioned the recovery and resilience plan. So uh, uh, for a broader uh, uh, perspective, recovery and resilience plan was uh, the main part of our post-COVID economic recovery plan, next generation EU. And what recovery resilience plan does, it combines investments and structural uh, reforms to, uh, initially it was meant for post-COVID economic recovery while facilitating green and uh, digital uh, transitions. So 37% of the money uh, must uh, go for a green transition, 20% to digital transition, and there are many other uh, aims and also strong link with uh, structural uh, reforms. So uh, when we are assessing uh, Poland's and Hungary's recovery and resilience plans, we are assessing them against requirements of recovery and resilience facility uh, uh, regulation. Uh, and uh, as regards uh, Poland, uh, the, uh, the Poland's plan is now approved by uh, Council, but there are some uh, independence of the judiciary milestones and targets which Poland must meet before it uh, 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 can actually access the money. Uh, in, case, uh, in case of Hungary, the assessment of uh, Hungary's recovery and resilience plan is still ongoing. Uh, uh, if you look geopolitically, uh, of course, we see that uh, Poland and Hungary are on very different pages. Uh, Poland is indeed, uh, so to say, at the forefront of the, uh, uh, our effort to stop Russia's aggression, to support Ukraine. It's hosting millions of Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, and uh, indeed uh, engaging uh, very strongly and in a sense leading this uh, work in the European Union, whereas Hungary is dragging its uh, feet, delaying sanctions, looking for excuses. So geopolitically, uh, uh, indeed, uh, it, it, it's an issue. It has delayed uh, adoption notably of the six uh, sanctions package against uh, uh, Russia. So something which uh, we uh, continue, uh, obviously, uh, uh, to deal with uh, in a broader setting, but also specifically within the rule of law uh, procedure, as I uh, mentioned. Hi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's fascinating. My name is Dinda Elliott. I'm the executive director at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. And I wanted to ask you, we're, we're witnessing right now a policy in the US of decoupling, um, economic decoupling with China, especially in the area of technology sales and investment. And I'm just wondering, will Europe be pursuing the same path or given the complex strategy that you just talked about earlier, uh, do you think that Europe's, you know, policy will be somewhat different? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, as I was um, uh, outlining already in the speech, uh, we are not uh, pursuing uh, decoupling with uh, China. So for us, it's uh, more about diversification and risk management. Uh, so our uh, economies are closer interlinked. So EU and China economy is closer interlinked, so like US and uh, China uh, economy. So uh, uh, we are not decoupling, we are addressing level playing field issues, and there are many, as we know, uh, and uh, we are uh, making sure that there are no dependencies on uh, critical uh, uh, minerals, critical inputs uh, uh, from uh, China. That's where this uh, uh, question of uh, diversification of our supply chains uh, and risk management uh, comes in. And that's the thinking behind now, uh, also in the context of Russia's war, 
uh, of renewed push for uh, moving uh, towards uh, uh, finalizing our different uh, trade agreements around uh, the world to have more possibilities for diversification and more uh, choices uh, uh, for our uh, companies, both for imports and uh, exports. So our answer is more addressing level playing field uh, uh, issues and uh, uh, diversification and risk management. Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hi. Vice President, for being with us today. My name is uh, Grégoire Jaco. I'm a research fellow at MIT and advisor to the French President on African Affairs. Mm. As a European, we can notice that a number of clouds are now flying over the continent, scary clouds. Social, with the rise of populism and extremes. Economic, with this rampant inflation and sovereign debt. And military, with a Russian threat. And one may start to fear for the survival of the EU within the next one or two years. And so my question would be the following. First of all, what are the risks we should plan for, especially if starting this winter? And second, from the Commission side, what would be a possible way forward to ensure the survival, but not only, also the unity and the strength of the European bloc for the next one or two years ahead? Uh, well, uh Indeed, uh, the uh, issues and uh, threats we are facing are uh, very uh, serious, but if anything, I think it uh, uh, has the opposite effect on the EU. It uh, uh, does not have a tendency towards uh, uh, disintegration. I think it has a tendency towards stronger unity and integration. And uh, EU has been uh, holding together, well, not without some problems and issues, as we just discussed, but broadly speaking, uh, uh, EU has uh, held uh, together in a uh, united way, in a spirit of European solidarity. That was the way we handled uh, COVID-19 pandemics. That's the way we are now handling Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, clearly, uh, 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 there are uh, issues, and this uh, winter is uh, going to be uh, difficult, notably in terms of uh, uh, energy security, in terms of uh, energy uh, prices, uh, uh, because clearly there are uh, economic uh, ramifications of the war. But then the best way to deal with economic consequences of the war is uh, to stop the war. And for this, we need to stay the course, both putting pressure on Russia and uh, uh, supporting uh, Ukraine. Uh, in between, uh, uh, indeed, we have this uh, uh, very uh, complicated economic policy uh, choice. Uh, on one hand, we need to support uh, our households and companies uh, facing high energy prices. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, cannot afford uh, uh, broad-based fiscal stimulus. Uh, both uh, from debt sustainability point of view and also uh, we cannot have a policy mix where uh, fiscal policy runs contrary to the monetary policy. So uh, the monetary policy aims to reduce uh, inflation, so fiscal policy cannot uh, fuel inflation because if it will be with another hand fueling inflation, it will lead to further increase in interest uh, rates and even less uh, fiscal space and fiscal room for uh, manoeuvre. So it's a delicate policy balance which we need to find. And then it must be said that uh, uh, the guidance also of international uh, monetary fund in the context of the uh, annual uh, uh, meetings which we just had is uh, very uh, similar to that one uh, of European uh, uh, Commission. So those uh, temporary uh, so the support measures need to be temporary and uh, targeted, and the fiscal stance needs to be uh, broadly uh, neutral. And then we need to address the uh, root cause of inflation, which is high energy prices uh, by itself, and that's why we are uh, having a number of uh, emergency interventions in energy market, uh, also demand management uh, measures, other measures. I will not now go uh, into all the energy response we are now having. That would be worth another lecture. 
um, uh, but uh, uh, clearly that those energy uh, security issues are going to be uh, very high on our agenda and it's important that we uh, go uh, through this uh, winter and maintain this uh, spirit of unity and uh, solidarity. Hi, um, thank you, Mr. Vice President, for joining us today. And my name is Carrie Jell, a uh, research fellow from Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I actually have a question. Like um, you just described, China is a uh, collaborator in some uh, in the gl global climate change issues, and a uh, com uh, competitor, and even rivalry in some of the economic uh, element, uh, economic demo uh, domains and uh, security issues. So um, my question is. Um, I wonder, do you think it's fair actually to demand and push another uh, big country like China to work with you on the global issues while well, at the same time, uh, you know, treat it as a rivalry that there's just, I, I sense like no trust on uh, economic um, collaborations. And and I, I, saw it, uh, I thought it as a uh, uh, lack of sustainable, uh, yeah, in this kind of mindset. What do you think of it? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, it's, it's a complex uh, uh, relation, as, as you just uh, uh, reiterated. Well, on climate change, uh, the question is, uh, uh, do we have a choice and options? There is this famous uh, saying, we don't have a planet B. So we are all sharing the same uh, planet. So we need to address the global uh, challenges uh, all uh, uh, together. Uh, and uh, uh, China is acknowledging this and uh, cooperating, so setting also uh, out its uh, uh, targets towards climate neutrality, not by 2050, by 2060. Of course, uh, uh, the question will be uh, how exactly it's implemented, that the emissions are uh, really uh, going down. Uh, because, well, uh, uh, it's clear with China is the biggest uh, emitter. If China is not on board, uh, we will not be able to uh, fight uh, climate change by our own. For example, uh, EU is uh, producing somewhere in the range of 9% of global uh, emissions. So we need to cooperate, uh, especially with China, with G20 countries to, uh, to address this uh, uh, challenge. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, uh, true that we have uh, uh, different socioeconomic uh, uh, systems and uh, 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 China is not sharing with us uh, the Western democratic values. So from that point of view, it is a systemic uh, uh, rivalry. We are promoting different socioeconomic uh, uh, models. And on economic compet uh, competitiveness issues, uh, we already uh, spoke. Uh, we need this level playing field and uh, something we are working to, uh, to, to get closer to. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Francesco Castra. I'm an MPA student at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I have a question, and I would like to refer to the speech uh, the High Representative Borrell gave at the beginning of this week. And, and I'm quoting here. He said, it is the identity, stupid. It is no, it's no longer the economy. It's the identity. And since you're also in charge of the economy, um, I would like to ask you if you agree, first of all, on that statement. And second, uh, what's the European Commission doing in this regard? And maybe third point, um, I'm wondering if the transatlantic relationship and the US in general can be of some inspiration here. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, I didn't have a uh, possibility to, uh, to, to, to listen to the speech you uh, uh, referred to, but I could imagine more or less uh, the uh, context and, 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 and uh, what it uh, possibly uh, referring to. Uh, 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 and uh, in a sense, it's uh, true. If you look now at uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war, it is about uh, identity. It's about uh, democracy uh, versus autocracy. Uh, it's about uh, uh, Russia's uh, empiric uh, ambitions. Uh, uh, so it's not, uh, uh, not economy anymore, uh, uh, because economically it's unmitigated disaster, including from Russia, because uh, Russia's uh, economy uh, this year is uh, suffering a severe uh, recession as a result of uh, Western sanctions, and will keep uh, putting uh, more. Uh, pressure, so Russia is pursuing it uh, at 
huge economic cost uh, uh, to itself and of course creating uh, even uh, uh, bigger uh, both humanitarian and uh, economic cost on Ukraine and putting substantial cost on the rest of the world. So that's, uh, that's uh, unfortunately the reality. So uh, uh, here we're not talking in economic uh, terms uh, anymore, and that's why I was referring to this existential battle we are uh, dealing with. And uh, to deal with this, uh, transatlantic relations are uh, key, and uh, that's why it's important that we are working together, uh, 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 EU and US, uh, uh, that we work together with other like-minded parties, uh, uh, partners, and luckily there are uh, many in the world, and we try to bring also uh, uh, the ones which are currently maybe not like-minded, but potentially could be like-minded with uh, us. So this transatlantic leadership in this regard will be very important. Uh, my name is Mikhail Soldatenko. I'm a visiting researcher from Ukraine. And Mr. Uh, Vice President, thank you very much for your great speech and for robust and unequivocal support for Ukrainian people in their existential fight against the Russian aggression. And that's not existential, not only for us, but for the whole Europe and freedom and uh, security in Europe. Uh, Ukrainian people are paying not only in economical terms, but in hundreds of lives every day. And so we really appreciate your support. And uh, my question relates to the Kyiv Security Compact, which is proposed by uh, Mr. Andriy Yermak, Chief of Staff of Ukraine, and uh, Mr. Rasmussen, former uh, uh, Secretary General of NATO. And so the Kyiv Security Compact relates to both economical support and uh, military support for Ukraine. And basically, the main idea is to transfer the support, the status quo that exists right now, into the legal terms. Namely, the uh, West, the EU member states, the US, would put their support into the commitments that in the future they would support it. So Ukrainian people would be supported in their fight in the meantime when we will become the full-fledged member of the NATO and European Union. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh yeah, well, uh, indeed, uh, 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 as I was outlining, it's uh, 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 clear that we will uh, stay the course and we will continue to provide uh, Ukraine with uh, necessary uh, support. It concerns uh, uh, financial, economical, uh, uh, humanitarian, uh, military support, also uh, political uh, support. The EU has made a major step in uh, acknowledging Ukraine as EU uh, candidate uh, country. And uh, also when we are uh, looking now, uh, later this month in Berlin, there is going to be a uh, Ukraine reconstruction uh, uh, conference uh, co-chaired by Germany as G7 uh, presidency and European um, uh, uh, Commission, where we'll be discussing, uh, 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 so to say, post-war reconstruction. And from the EU side, we are willing to anchor it in uh, also, uh, so to say, uh, into uh, uh, Ukraine's accession pass uh, uh, towards uh, the, uh, uh, the EU. Uh, in terms of financial support, because I'm more uh, dealing more hands-on on the financial support for Ukraine, uh, uh, what, um, uh, uh, what uh, uh, our Ukrainian uh, counterparts are telling us, it's, of course, they're expecting a kind of more stable, more predictable uh, financing flow than uh, this uh, year. Because, uh, okay, it's true, this year we did many things on ad hoc basis as the war uh, uh, began. Uh, well, we have uh, mobilized uh, substantial resources from the EU. So this Team Europe has mobilized some 19 billion euros. Here we're talking EU support, EU member state support, and European financial uh, institutions. So for the next year, this was one of the topics we were discussing also on the sites of IMF and World Bank meetings. The estimate is of financing gap of some uh, three and a half billion euros per month, well, euros on dollars, uh, how you put it now, it's more or less the same. Uh, um, uh, 
And uh, from the EU side, we are currently working on uh, providing some uh, one and a half billion euros uh, uh, per month and expecting other international uh, partners to uh, cover uh, the uh, remaining uh, part. And uh, from European Commission, we will soon be uh, coming with a proposal how to structure it in a, so to say, uh, one uh, goal that we also don't need to repeatedly go back to uh, member states, that there is a stability and a predictability for uh, Ukraine as regards uh, covering those uh, basic uh, financial uh, uh, needs. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'm Kenneth. I'm from Harvard Law School. I have a question regarding the export control and sanctions enforcement against China, uh, EU. So I think in the uh, legislation level and policy making level, we see that EU upgraded its export control uh, uh, regulation last year. And I think that's uh, uh, from the uh, last regulation was uh, in promulgated 2000 and nine and then we upgraded that last year and also in the policy making level we see that the TTC joint statement with the United uh, with the United States we see that we want to um, enforce the uh, use export control as a tool to combat the uh, supply chain security issues but on the enforcement level we see that there are very rare sanctions for export control against China I think the only uh, enforcement last year is some uh, sanctions against uh, uh, Chinese officials because of Xinjiang issues. So my question is, um, given that we have the legislation and the policy making posture while very less enforcement, it is because it is uh, EU's position that we avoid where we are cautious against imposing uh, unilateral restrict, uh, trade restrictive measure, or is it because we still want to keep a good relationship uh, economically speaking with China? Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, on uh, export uh, controls, uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, our Trade and Technology Council has provided us with a good uh, platform to cooperate on export controls. We have one working group dealing specifically with this uh, uh, topic, and actually just yesterday I had a meeting with Gina Raimondo. We discussed how we can uh, advance this work now further with a view of the next Trade and Technology uh, Council, but also in the next steps. Uh, it also must be said that the uh, kind of this relationship and uh, trust and cooperation which we have built in the area of export controls helped us uh, quite a bit uh, to be fast and efficient and coordinated in putting export controls with uh, Russia in the context of its uh, aggression. Well, uh, uh, we are aware obviously that uh, uh, the recent US uh, decision on putting uh, additional export controls on uh, China concerned, uh, concerning advanced uh, chips and we are uh, currently assessing the uh, impact on the uh, EU. We need some input uh, from our member states, from our industry maybe to understand uh, better uh, the, uh, the impacts and you mentioned enforcement actually that was uh, exactly one of the topics uh, which we discussed that we need to uh, strengthen our cooperation in the area of enforcement of export controls so this will uh, continue to be a prominent work stream in the context of our transatlantic uh, trade and uh, technology council Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your talk. My name is Peter Stasovskis. I'm an architect um, and a research fellow at the School of Engineering at Harvard. So many countries in the world have been trying to transition to green energy sources for a long time. The war in Ukraine has given the EU a reason to accelerate investment in green energy. But first, is it realistic to think that an actually significant percent of the EU's energy supply will all of a sudden shift to green sources in the next three to five years? And if so, surely once the war is over, will not the pressure to shift to green energy reduce? Will not the EU be tempted to shift back at least a little bit to Russian fuels as a result of reconciliation with Russia? Thank you. Well, yeah, on uh, green uh, energy, we in a sense uh, touched upon this uh, topic, uh, how, how war uh, 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 in Ukraine is affecting uh, uh, our shift to uh, green uh, energy. Uh, uh, as I said, in medium to long term, if anything, it's accelerating uh, our shift to uh, green uh, energy as regards specifically uh, Russia's uh, uh, fossil uh, fuels. Uh, I think that strategic decision is taken and we are moving away from our dependency from uh, Russian uh, fossil uh, fuels. 
uh, in a short term, uh, 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 as I was mentioning, there may be more uh, fossil energy, including uh, coal, not only uh, gas, because, uh, well, we, we are in a, uh, a situation of basically uh, energy emergency, so we need to use all options uh, which, which are available to ensure uh, energy uh, security. Uh, uh, but, um, and it's true that, um, uh, uh, so to say, green energy will not appear all of a sudden by itself. Uh, it will require uh, investment. And we are uh, foreseeing this uh, investment, uh, uh, both at the EU level, I was mentioning uh, the uh, uh, target of 37% of spending of recovery and resilience uh, uh, facility on uh, uh, green targets, including uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, there is uh, similarly a 30% mainstreaming target in EU uh, cohesion policy for the same aims. Uh, uh, just recently, we have agreed a uh, Repower EU facility, which will help us to address, among other things, those uh, green energy aims. Uh, so strategically, this uh, direction is set. Uh, targets of 55% emission reduction and uh, climate neutrality by 2050 are there. So we will uh, stay uh, uh, the course, and uh, this uh, share of uh, green and renewable energy will only continue to increase in the EU. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Vice President. My name is George Papadimitriou. I'm with the Harvard International Law Journal. Um, I have a question that uh, might be uh, somewhat out of your, your main portfolio about the common security and defense policy. Um, I, I remember last year when I was uh, speaking with Europeans about this time, uh, there was a lot of reaction to the U.S. withdrawal of, from Afghanistan um, and perception that the U.S. was uh, departing from uh, its international posture, and, and I'm wondering, um, it, it felt like there was some optimism about uh, greater Euro European security integration uh, and um, some more types of exploration with uh, uh, different types of force posture. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I, and I, my sense is that that's kind of gone away in the, the Ukraine conversation. It's much more about uh, the financial uh, aid to Ukraine than uh, developing European force posture itself. So I'm wondering um, your assessment of those conversations, where they're going, uh, if um, there's anything, any developments on that track that, that we might be missing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, on uh, common security defense uh, policy, uh, clearly uh, Russia's aggression uh, puts new uh, spotlight on this. And it's a, a fact having uh, such an aggressive and uh, unpredictable uh, neighbor uh, we're going to pay much more attention to our uh, uh, defense and security uh, issues. There's going to be much more military uh, spending in Europe, uh, we assume also in uh, other uh, regions. Uh, so it's important that, uh, of course, what we do, we do in a smart uh, way, uh, also looking for synergies which can be reached, including in the EU. There had been uh, many studies, you know, a number of different uh, 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 military equipment, uh, uh, you know, in different areas of uh, military, how much it is in the US, how much it's in uh, uh, Europe, and in Europe it's, you know, this whole uh, platter of all kind of equipment with uh, uh, problems with uh, interability and so on and so forth. So we, uh, uh, when we are now uh, investing in strengthening our defense, we must do it in a, a smart uh, way uh, so that uh, 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 there is less fragmentation, uh, more, uh, uh, more efficiency on what we are uh, doing. Uh, and uh, clearly one, expect, one can expect that uh, kind of EU cooperation in the uh, uh, military area will continue, uh, only continue to uh, strengthen. Of course, uh, uh, what is important to ensure that what we are doing is, so to say, complementing what NATO is doing and not contradicting uh, what NATO is doing as NATO remains our main security alliance. Till this year. And what I'm concerned about is, how should we think about this? Because as you correctly mentioned, uh, there are really no winners in this war. Uh, both parties are having insane, uh, insane and huge costs on this. and. It, 
and so we see a country that is willing to pursue some nationalistic pipe dream uh, at the expense of several decades of economic development, at the expense of the lives of its own citizens, which to me just does not seem rational. So the question is, is economic integration still a good uh, tool to avoid war? And as we're also talking about the trans standing partnership, how should we think about this as part of the trans standing partnership and what roles should the EU and the US play in this? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, this um, uh, question of economic uh, integration is uh, uh, something uh, which, uh, 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 which we are now uh, reconsidering. Uh, that was uh, assumption uh, uh, or one of the assumptions uh, uh, of uh, entering this uh, mutual uh, uh, dependency with uh, Russia on energy uh, supplies. Uh, uh, that was uh, uh, assumption uh, through this, what Germans call Wander, Wandel, uh, Handel, uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, which also there is lots of uh, uh, handle or trade, but not much transition or Wandel. <laughs> so, um, uh, so uh, yes, this is something which uh, we are currently uh, uh, reconsidering. So that's uh, why, uh, uh, once again, I was talking of uh, the concepts of French shoring, diversification, risk management. It's all very much in our agenda uh, right now. Uh, and it's clear that we need to uh, uh, intensify our cooperation with democratic like-minded uh, partners. Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Professor of Government in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I really enjoyed your presentation and lecture. I have a question. After many, many years of leading EU negotiations for 28 countries, and more recently reading, leading negotiations after Britain has left, what is the difference on the key issues you talked about, sanctions against Russia, WTO reform and transatlantic trade. Has Britain's exit helped, hurt, or not mattered? <laughs> uh, well, uh, 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 well uh, from that point of view, uh, uh, UK uh, has uh, been and continues to be a promoter of uh, international uh, trade, international trade uh, relations. Uh, so, uh, uh, on some uh, areas like uh, uh, WTO uh, reform, we uh, continue to uh, cooperate. Uh, UK is part of the like-minded parties group, uh, Ottawa group, uh, uh, which is dealing with uh, these and other global trade uh, issues. Uh, well, on uh, transatlantic uh, uh, trade, uh, uh, well, transatlantic trade uh, continues to be uh, very uh, strong, and as I was mentioning, it's our main avenue of uh, trade and uh, uh, investment. So, um, also we are cooperating uh, very uh, closely now in a context of Russia's aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine in terms of both support for Ukraine and. Uh, uh, and uh, sanctions against Russia. Actually, also on the sides uh, of IMF and World Bank meetings, I had a meeting with uh, uh, UK uh, uh, Chancellor, uh, former Chancellor by now, quasi <laughs> Uh So, uh, 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 it's uh, true we have, as you know, our uh, difficulties and our uh, differences, notably on the implementation of Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, which continues to be an irritant which we need to deal with, but uh, that does not change the fact that uh, on global picture we are like-minded partners and we, uh, we are uh, cooperating closely in many of those areas. So I think we have time for two more questions. Hi, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, my name is Jack Haney. I'm a 1L here at the law school. Um, I know earlier in response to one question, you talked about the EU's role in post-conflict reconstruction in Ukraine. And I just wanted to kind of expand that question out a little bit more. What role do you see for the United States and for other transatlantic institutions and international institutions like the World Bank or the IMF more generally in building a post-war Ukraine? 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, the Ukraine reconstruction is uh, going to be a major uh, endeavor, and uh, uh, no one knows at this stage uh, uh, how much it will cost. Uh, the World Bank sometime uh, uh, put an estimate of uh, uh, 349 or 69, I know, I forgot, uh, billion uh, dollars. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, truth is that the damage continues with every day. So, uh, uh, but in any case, we see that the scale of the problem and financing need for uh, uh, Ukraine reconstruction is immense. So it's uh, clear that the global community will need to work together to support Ukraine in its uh, reconstruction. Uh, we had been outlining from uh, the EU side that we are uh, willing to lead this effort, we are willing to uh, uh, contribute a substantial share of uh, financing, but obviously uh, we uh, uh, are uh, in close uh, contact with US, with G7, with other international uh, partners, because it needs to be a, a truly international uh, effort, and obviously it will require also uh, involvement of international financial institutions like IMF and uh, World Bank. We need to see the role of private sector in this uh, reconstruction and uh, see how to help private sector mitigate the country risk in, in case of uh, 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 Ukraine, which is clearly uh, present given uh, current uh, circumstances. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of financing, we also need to see how we are able uh, to uh, follow through the principle aggressor pace, uh, uh, how uh, to uh, make sure that uh, Russia is paying reparations for the damage it's uh, creating, how to use uh, uh, confiscated Russian assets for this uh, uh, purpose. So it's uh, quite a multidimensional uh, task. So we are now working on this structure of Ukraine reconstruction uh, platform. Uh, I was mentioning that later this month there is going to be a dedicated conference in uh, Berlin uh, where uh, we will be discussing and hopefully furthering those uh, uh, issues and uh, uh, preparation for this reconstruction effort. Well, in between, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, we need to continue to provide short-term financing to cover basic financing needs and also uh, quick repairs, because uh, uh, despite the war ongoing, it's clear that uh, uh, the repairs are needed for most basic uh, uh, infrastructure to have the uh, basic uh, uh, functioning uh, uh, of, um, uh, of economy, of um, uh, 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 living infrastructure. So and we are providing some financing uh, already now also for this uh, basic uh, 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 repairs, which, which are needed uh, right now. So it's going to be a huge endeavor, and it's important that the uh, international community works uh, together on this. And that was also one of our uh, topics of conversations with uh, uh, Janet Yellen, U.S. Treasury Secretary, uh, this week. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tala Ram. I'm a pol public policy student at the Harvard Kennedy School. I also work for the Baha'i International Community Representation to the EU. Um, you mentioned the relationship that the EU will need to form with the developing world, and we've seen in some cases where policies um, from the EU have unintended impacts in the developing world. For example, um, the common agricultural policy and its relationship in, food in terms of food security. Uh, so my question is, how, um, how can trade policy be part of shaping uh, or co contributing to the well-being of the rest of the world, in particular in trying to achieve the sustainable development goals? Uh, yeah, on uh, this, uh, uh, indeed, uh, this uh, has been uh, one of the uh, important uh, pillars of the uh, review of our trade policy. So now we have a new uh, trade uh, policy uh, uh, strategy, uh, which has three uh, uh, keywords, uh, open, sustainable, assertive. Well, on open, we uh, reconfirm our commitment to uh, open and uh, uh, fair uh, rules-based international trade, but it's uh, clear that we need to uh, strengthen the sustainability and make sure that uh, the trade is uh, contributing to the 
uh, well-being of uh, the uh, people across the world and our uh, trading uh, partners. So, uh, more recently, we had also uh, a review of this trade and sustainable development uh, chapters in our uh, trade uh, agreements, really uh, putting more uh, emphasis on this sustainability uh, aspects, uh, ensuring that there is a respect for uh, 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 fundamental rights, there is respect for uh, labor rights uh, in our trading uh, partners, uh, there is uh, uh, respect for uh, uh, env en environmental norms, that uh, uh, there is uh, no regression clauses, like uh, that countries would not lower their uh, uh, environmental or labor rights standards to attract uh, trade or uh, in investment. So we are uh, very uh, mindful on, on, on this and the new trade uh, uh, policy strategy, which we now have, I, I would say it's a, a greenest EU uh, trade uh, policy strategy we had ever uh, had. And now we are already applying in uh, uh, this new approach uh, in uh, uh, free trade uh, negotiations, which we are uh, currently uh, pursuing. For example, uh, recently, we concluded negotiations with uh, New Zealand, which I would say really state-of-art uh, uh, trade and sustainable uh, development uh, uh, chapter. But this is approach we are now uh, uh, pursuing across different uh, negotiations. But what is important, of course, that we are not uh, saying one size fits all. So we need to take uh, into account the different, different level of economic development of our partners, different needs. So we're in a sense, tailoring this sustainability uh, approach for uh, different countries with uh, which we are uh, negotiating. Well, Mr. Vice President, I know you had a very late night last night and you had to get up very early to catch the flight here. Thank you so much for not only your speech today, but subjecting yourself to almost an hour's worth of questioning from <laughs> Harvard. It's uh, something that uh, I, is not necessarily for anyone who's had to endure this, including many of our doctoral candidates room, something that's the most pleasant experience. But I know for on behalf of the Harvard community, um, it really is an education for all of us and a chance for us to have this dialogue is so important in terms of building on the pillars of our shared values, our relationship, the transatlantic partnership, and most importantly, for you to be an exemplar of what we represent here in the West, an openness and accountability and a willingness um, to seek truth from facts uh, and uh, to be um, really an embedded partner in um, a very turbulent times ahead. So please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Vice President and the rest of his team. Thank you. Thank you.